systems. G'day and welcome to Liberty Chat for this week, uh, the 20th of April, 2022. <clears throat> your weekly roundup of all things liberty, all things liberal Democrats, uh, all things uh, interesting in politics, what people are getting right, what people are getting wrong, and what our Senate candidates are up to last week and next week. Uh, my name is John Humphreys. I'm the uh, national president of the party and your host for this week. Uh, you will have Lady Liberty back soon enough. I know you've been stuck with me as host for two weeks in a row, uh, but we will be rotating it and mixing it up. But I uh, hope you'll stick with me. Indulge me for a little bit longer. Um, the show is now for the second season. We are running directly live to YouTube uh, and to Facebook. So welcome to the people who are listening to us live. For the people listening later on a uh, recorded version of the video, please do show up next week. Uh, every Wednesday, 7.30 Eastern Time, and you can join in and ask the questions. I see the questions are already coming in. Uh, we will answer some of them as we go, especially the good ones, uh, and the good comments, we'll read it out. And look, if you've got some good burns and uh, you can you can riff us properly, then we'll read them out as well. So uh, uh, do feel free to join us. Uh, but joining me this week uh, on the panel, we have uh, four of our lead Senate candidates, just running through quickly, uh, John Ruddock, you, you know him, you love him. He's here nearly every week because he can't get away from us, our lead Senate candidate for New South Wales. We have returning this week, David Limbrick, our lead Senate candidate for Victoria. We have Hi, for the everybody. first time, uh, and we will have a good chat about this soon, for the first time in the room, sitting Senator Sam McMahon from the Northern Territory and our lead Senate candidate for the Northern Territory. And he's back again because he knows how to do the technology to make this work. Uh, Tofa Field, our lead Senate candidate for Tasmania. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining in the chat. Um, to start with then, I think, because we went to him last last week, let's go to JR first this week. Uh, JR, what's been happening this week in your world and in politics in general? Well, look, I went to the show on Easter Monday with my young family and uh basically there was a place that was absolutely packed i must have walked past 50 to 100,000 people and i counted about five masks out of that that sample of people this is in the heart of the western suburbs of sydney and a lot of rural people come to sydney for this okay common sense people now when i walk around a shopping center on the north shore of sydney it is still the case that over 50 percent of people in affluent areas have still got their masks on so I think that tells us where we're going to get our votes from. Um, mm. Now, the um, this in terms of the look this this Friday, I'm at uh, Taree up, up with our very good <laughs> candidate Mark Hornshaw, and then I'm going to a big freedom event in um, Singleton. And I'm hoping to get to one in Warhope also on Saturday. But in terms of the federal election, look, all of last year I was saying to people, ScoMo is going to get re-elected because the polls were sort of 53 Labor. 47 SCOMA. And I thought, well, that's close enough for an incumbent government. Then we get into this year, something happened over Christmas. The polls just went, went bang, you know, SCOMA went up to about 50, 57. I think there was a 58 in there, uh, you know, and I thought, okay, well, that gap is too big. Something's happened. The country has decided it wants to have a change of government. That is what I very strongly felt. And now, now, you know, often election campaigns get criticised for being boring. This one is not being a boring campaign. Uh, this, you know, and this, it was very, very dramatic what happened last week with Albo. And he, you know, like, you know, just, uh, I think the difference, Albo actually does believe in things. Albo is a hardcore leftist. He basically is, you know, scratching and he's still got his little Trotsky, Trotsky -like instincts just beneath the surface, but he's trying to pretend he's just a, doesn't really, you know, just a centrist. He's just a centrist. He doesn't really believe it. So he's got to pretend that he's someone he's not. Scobo, on the other hand, doesn't have to pretend he is just, he is someone who just loves all this campaigning and all, shaking hand, not talking about policy, not talking about anything of any substance, just all this, li these little fluff events. ScoMo loves the fluff. Now, um, but the, the interesting thing was, all the media, including the ABC, saying Albo's had a terrible week, Albo's had a terrible yeah. week. Well, then we see the polls come out, not that bad, his personal popularity, but the people's voting intention has not changed. But what's significant for us is, in both the nine poll and the news poll, they are recording huge other and undecided votes. Okay, news poll said that it, it was the record in the history of news poll they've never had. They had 29% of people were not going to vote for a major party. That doesn't even include the about the, the sort of 15% who said I haven't made up my mind yet. 
So, yeah. uh, look, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, let, let's just roll up our sleeves. I think we've got a very good uh, candidate uh, set in place. Uh, we've got our ballot draws on Friday, which will be be, a, be an important moment. And uh, but look, I'm I'm I'll have some other things to say about some of our opponents in the freedom movement later on in the show because I was quite upset with some of the comments last night on the the Queensland Maverick thing. But I'll save that for my next moment, John. Yes, thank you. So um, it's good to hear you're catching up with Mark Hornshaw. He is an excellent candidate that we have running up in the seat of Line up in the uh, the north coast of New South Wales. He was one of the the co-authors of the. Uh, Freedom Manifesto uh, as a lecturer at Notre Dame University in economics, in free market economics and entrepreneurship. So a very appropriate, excellent candidate in Mark. Um, JR just name dropped the Mavericks debate last night. Well, I think we'll get into chatting about that in a minute. Uh, it did remind me that we are actually live streaming this at the same time as the leaders debate. Uh, and of course, I suspect what that's going to cause is no one will be watching the leaders debate because everyone's going to be turning that off and switching in to this show, which is, of course, the more entertaining of the two, uh, with certainly with more substance um, and better quality uh, candidates. Um, having said all that, let's throw to one of our uh, lead candidates, David Limprick. Welcome back. Uh, what's been happening in your week and the world in politics in, in Victoria? Uh, there was lots of exciting things that happened today. I went, so if you're not aware, today is 420 day. So I went to a 420 rally. Now, the last time I went to one of these was in 2019 and there was thousands of people there and there was big clouds of smoke and it was all pretty chilled and uh, apart from a couple of incidents. Um, today, well, David, I went just so that people be aware, uh, not everyone will be aware what 420 420 uh, is. To. The 420 is a celebration of people against uh, cannabis prohibition. So if you're not aware, our party opposes cannabis prohibition. Um, we have ever since we were formed. Um, we do this on the basis of bodily autonomy, that um, the government shouldn't uh, decide what you can and can't put into your own body. We've been consistent on this with uh, cannabis and also vaccine mandates, which, which is another issue that came up today. Um, so we went along to show support. I went along with two of our great candidates, um, Anthony Cozio from uh, uh, the, our candidate for Fraser and Amanda Mead, our candidate for Wannan. And we went along to check it out. Now, it was very, very different. This is the first post-pandemic uh, 420 rally I've been to. Um, there was less people than normal, but there was lots and lots of cops everywhere. They had sniffer dogs. They had um, mounted police. They had cops everywhere. Um, there was no weed, no one was smoking any weed. Um, and it was pretty depressing actually. So the government in Victoria has just come out and said, we're going to do this community policing <laughs> thing. And, you know, we're going to have a more, you know, friendly police force. Well, I, I got community police today and I can tell you, it's pretty bloody scary actually. Like I, I didn't feel very safe at all. In fact, I would have felt safer if the police and the dogs weren't there, but anyway, um, I didn't get busted for anything for once. So that's good. Um, but it was, it was good, like, talking to a bunch of people and, um, yeah, a bunch of them knew us. Um, the media came along, although Channel 9 interviewed me, but they ended up publishing something about vaccine mandates and not about the 420 rally, which I was a bit disappointed about. But, um, yeah, it was good to go along and, and um, see what was going on with that today. And, yeah, it was pretty sad the way that the police cracked down on it. The other thing that happened today in Victoria was... They announced some easing of uh, restrictions. So in Victoria, we, we currently have uh, vaccine passports. They call open premises directions. Basically, if you're not vaccinated, you can't get into a pub or a library or a restaurant or a whole bunch of other services. And we also have these worker vaccine mandates. So they have general ones and specific worker ones. But basically means if you're not vaccinated, there's a whole bunch of jobs you can't do. Now, the government was really confusing in their messaging here. And they were confusing to the point where the media even didn't really understand what the government was trying to do. And what the government was actually doing was getting rid of, from Friday night, getting rid of the open premises directions, which means the unvaccinated people can go to the pub or go to a restaurant. And they were signaling that they're thinking about and maybe one day getting rid of the worker mandates, which Channel 7 published tonight that they're getting rid of the general worker mandates, which they're actually not not on Friday anyway. Uh, so there's going to be mass confusion tomorrow. Um, lots of people who've lost their jobs over these stupid vaccine worker mandates are really uh, upset. They were hanging out for this because they want to get back to work. 
Um, it's really miserable the way that the government's just put them on the dole, especially during a worker shortage. And we're in this situation now where a whole bunch of people are confused and think that they can go back to work, yet they can't. And on Saturday, um, if you're unvaccinated, you can go to the pub, you can go to a restaurant, but you cannot work there, which makes sense to no one. No one. It's absolutely I was about to crazy. Ask if that was the case, that you can go and drink in the pub, but you can't serve the beer in the pub. This is the science, man. This is the science. Um, you know, and like I said the other week, like, um, you know, they put these vaccine mandates on in, in Parliament in Victoria and you know, ended up kicking out Tim Quilty and I and, and a couple of other members of Parliament because we refused to hand over our papers. And the whole reason, the whole rationale that they used there was uh, workplace health and safety. Now, I noticed that the government in their messaging and in the Chief Health Officer messaging don't talk about workplace health and safety at all because everyone knows it's a complete sham now that, you know, you can still get uh, and transmit COVID regardless of your vaccination status. I got COVID the other week. I've recovered now, pretty much recovered. I still feel a bit tired, but I'm okay. Uh, I probably caught it at Parliament, ironically. Um, I walked past the Premier the day after he got back, so maybe I caught it from the Premier himself. Who knows? Uh, you know, I don't I, it's, I don't understand these beastly, mysterious uh, viruses. But, um, yeah, so that's the situation where we're in, where there's a whole bunch of people that still can't work, the government said, yeah, we're thinking about, we're consulting about when you can go back to work. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty miserable situation. Um, the other awesome thing that happened last night, which my dear friend Topher was there too. Uh, we went along to Paul Barker's uh, campaign launch out in Geelong. Uh, it was really awesome. Um, you know, Paul was great. We had a, a bunch of great speakers. It was actually really poignant, actually, like people talking about their redemption stories and stuff, which I won't go into detail, but there was some like, was some pretty heavy stuff, right? And um, yeah. I'm sure Topher would agree. And, you know, I love these sort of redemption stories. And and the thing that I brought up uh, last night, and I think that's um, uh, important to consider for the party as a whole, is the idea that all libertarians uh, came from, not all of them, but most of them, especially in Australia, they came from somewhere else, right? They weren't brought up libertarian. They weren't brought up classical liberal beliefs necessarily they sort of came from somewhere else and i know i'm one of those people and most other people that i've met in the party are one of those people um there's some exceptions to that but mostly people came from somewhere else and that means that we have to be uh tolerant with people's uh history and backgrounds and be prepared to uh acknowledge and respect people's change in views because i've personally undergone a change in views i know many other people here have probably been the same and we have to be uh, considering that and not like other parties, like the Liberal Party, like the Labor Party, that see a mistake in your past and then uh, cancel you forever. We don't want to be like that. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's really good that we heard these sort of stories of redemption last night of people who've made bad choices in their life um, and, uh, and changed. And that's wonderful. I was really impressed with it and thought it was a great story. Well, that... That is good to hear. And I, I agree with you, the importance of uh, the possibility of redemption. That's not to say that mm. everyone deserves to be instantly forgiven the moment they've done something wrong, but the possibility of redemption is is absolutely essential in a functioning society. And mm -hmm. the Lib Dems uh, is much more than just a, an anti-woke party. That's that's not our main thing. But this is one of the, I think, the, the big problems with uh, the, the woke or the wokenistas is the lack of the ability of redemption, this willingness mm. to crucify people so quickly to hang them out to dry for anything they've said in the past. If people speak freely, they will misspeak. I mean, we're all doing this live, so you're going to hear every uh, you know error and um and ah that we we say directly to the camera. If mm. people speak freely, they're going to misspeak. They're going to say things they regret later. They're going to do things they regret later if they live freely. Uh, the idea that you're going to be hanged for all of it is a truly dangerous way to live life. Mm. Uh, there, there has to be redemption. Um, mm. So yes, I and I, I I suspect I know the story you were hearing, and it is a good one. Uh, and Paul mm. Barker is a great candidate, candidate for Karangamite, if you're in Karangamite. Um, yeah, he's a, he's an excellent candidate and a good friend of mine. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, another excellent Lib Dems candidate. Um, we, we do also have, I noticed, uh, Lady Liberty in the chat, Kate Fantanel, our lead Senate mm -hmm. candidate for WA. She's, uh, uh, she's I don't know which chat she's in, YouTube or, or Facebook, but she's in there somewhere. And it's as you were talking man. about how terrible Victoria is, I think she was uh, reminding you that WA may have you beat in terms of stupid, incoherent rules. Uh, there we go, that comments back up there. Um, 
Shocking. Uh, and someone commented the same thing that I thought when you said it's the science. And I note that when we say it's the science now, we nearly always do it facetiously. Mm. It's become mm -hmm. a, a butt of a joke. And that is a really sad thing because science is a good thing. It's an important thing. And the fact that the way science has been mistreated to the point where we just naturally use it as a punchline mm. uh, is, is a bit sad. Um, it's more sad for me. I'm one of the few politicians that's actually got any qualifications in science. <laughs> and I just rubbish it every time they talk about it because I'm just like, well, you know, science is a methodology, right? It's about, it's about looking for, you know, uh, putting forward a postulate, testing the postulate, you know, you know about science, right? Like it's a methodology and they talk about it as if it's a doctrine, uh, mm -hmm. as if it's like you're setting this truth that can never be challenged. And it's just so dangerous. And it's really anti-science, ironically. It's quite religious. I mean, it's been referred yeah. to, I believe, as scientism, right? I believe it's yeah, science. I believe yeah. it's the religion of scientism. Um, anyway, having said that, let, let's keep rolling uh, to introduce a new guest on this show and someone relatively new to the party. We're all very excited. I'm very excited to, to have you on the team. Uh, Senator for the Northern Territory, Dr. Sam McMahon, welcome to Liberty Chat. How are things going in the Northern Territory? Yeah, thanks very much, John, and uh, thanks for welcoming me to the team. Um, yeah, look, things in the Northern Territory are, are pretty busy. Um, we had Campbell up here for, uh, for 24 hours, basically, um, uh, before Easter, which was great um, to have him here, very well received. Um, now, since uh, since then, I've hit the road, and I basically spent my Easter. I did uh, three and a half thousand k's over Easter. Um, <clears throat> Travelled to a lot of wow. top end uh, remote indigenous communities, communities like Bullman, Beswick, Weemole, Nooka, Timber Creek, and uh, and a whole pile of little communities um, along the way. So that was a um, that was a pretty pretty busy Easter. Um, I'm back in Darwin for a couple of days now before hitting the road again and um, going to be um, heading down uh, down to Central Australia, down through Tennant Creek and Alice Springs and again out to, uh, to a whole pile of remote Indigenous communities as part of that trip. Um, now, very exciting uh, thing for, for myself personally and for the Lib Dems is that uh, we have announced that we are fielding a full ticket um, for the federal election. It is completely full. It can't get any fuller. Um, in right. fact, we've, we've had people um, trying to trying to actually squeeze in and, and we're like, we're, we're done. We've got everybody. So very excited. I mean, all right, we've only got two lower house and two Senate, but, um, you know, they, they are absolutely chockers. And, uh, you know, as of a couple of days ago, the CLP was still desperately scratching around um, trying to fill their second senate um seats so uh, so that was uh, pretty uh pretty uh, good for us that you know we had people willing to put their hands up very early on um and they were still begging and pleading with their members to find someone to fill that seat so um so that's fantastic news um the other thing that's coming up this week which is not so exciting is that uh, we've got our cho direction i think it's 55 kicking in this friday which is mandating uh, the third vaccination. Mm. So that is for all workers that come into contact with the public. Uh, so if you sit in a back office and you never contact anyone with the public, you're fine. But, you know, anyone else in retail, hospitality, professional services, etc., <clears throat> if you haven't had your third vaccination by Friday, you will be out of a job and um, businesses will be out of employees. So um, that's uh, that's very, very disappointing news, but that, that is pushing ahead. So that's something that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, they look like they're no chance of rolling it back at all. They've got no interest in um, cutting back on these mandates. And, and in fact, they're pushing on ahead uh, with them as, as hard and fast as they can. And, um, you know, we, uh, you know, as, um, as David said, we've also got the ridiculous situation where um, unvaccinated people can go to restaurants, pubs, nightclubs, etc. Glad that they can, that's good. But they can all be there, but the person behind the bar serving them has to be fully vaccinated. 
It's just completely and utterly ridiculous. There's no science behind it. There's no medicine behind it. Um, it's it's just stupid. You have to be vaccinated to work there, but you know, a couple of thousand people can pile on in unvaccinated. There's no logic whatsoever. Uh, we're also facing the legislation change that's um, that's going to come in up here because you know Labor's got a, an absolute majority, so they'll push it through. Um, that gives the CHO unfettered powers for two years. Um, this will give the CHO more powers than anyone else in Australia. He or anyone he designates will be able to walk into your house any time of the day or night and take you away and lock you up indefinitely. He will be able to seize anything from your house and take it away and do whatever he wants with it. Um, these, these powers are, are just completely insane, unnecessary, um, and, um, you know, you, you're, just, you're just taking away people's basic rights and freedoms. I mean, if the police want to come to your house, they have to get a warrant. Um, but the Cho won't have to. He can just walk in and cart you and your family off uh, if he believes that um, it's important for the sake of uh, limiting the, the spread of COVID. So, you know, we, we're just facing some absolutely desperate and, and diabolical um, rules that are coming up here in the Northern Territory. So I'm 100% I'm focused on standing up um, against, against these um, CHO directions and also legislation in the Northern Territory government. Of course, in the Northern Territory, different to the states, the, uh, the federal government, if it wanted to, could come in and squash this. You know, the, the, the federal government could do it. So, mm. you know, if Scott Morrison, and, and I've written to him twice and I've written to the Attorney General, you know, if they were fair income about um, their, their mantra of we don't support mandatory vaccination, if they were fair income about that, they could come into the Northern Territory at least and override what the Territory is doing but they, they have no desire or will to do so. Very disappointing. It's my understanding. We, we normally have a contest, I think, between uh, David and Kate, David Limbrick and Kate Fansnell as to who has the, the worst leader. They may have competition. I don't know if it's a competition anyone wants to win, but the rules in the Northern Territory sound appalling. Yeah, Sorry, David. yeah they are. Yeah, it's it's my understanding. What It's it's interesting that you, what you said there, Sam, about the federal government could come in and overrule. But it's also my understanding that even in the states, the government, the federal government could overrule because the data that they're using for enforcing these mandates is derived from the Australian Immunisation Register, which is a Commonwealth uh, responsibility. And they can define the terms under which data from that or derived data from that is used. They could prohibit it. And they haven't done so. They've chosen mm -hmm. to abandon the states on this and mm. just let them go wild. And they could have stepped in. They could have stepped in the Northern Territory. They could have stepped in in Victoria by changing the, by amending the Australian Immunisation Register Act, and they haven't done it. That's, that's correct, David. I mean, we, you know, that our federal government does own and control the AIR, and they can determine who has access to it. So that would have been one very easy way that they could have perhaps not stopped what the states were doing, but certainly made it a lot more difficult for them. Um, but of course, in the Northern Territory, they have the additional capacity that they can actually come in and overturn our legislation, uh, something that they can't do to the states. Which is something they do every time the Northern Territory passes good legislation. When they, yeah. uh, when Northern Territory passed uh, voluntary assisted dying, the, the Commonwealth stepped in and stopped that, but they won't step in and stop, um, I, I don't know what to call, uh, I mean, you hesitate to say pseudo-fascism because everyone throws the word around, but some quite authoritarian rules. They don't want to stop those, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. A comment came in from John Harris that's worth repeating here. He was saying that um, these rules, they're more about punishing the people who have been uh, recalcitrant, who have disobeyed, mm -hmm. who have Correct. thought for themselves. It seems to be more about punishing than the quote-unquote science. Um, yep. Sam, Sam, can I ask a question? Um, we get... It is appalling what's happening in the Northern Territory, arguably the worst in the world over the long term. So we really thank you for what you're doing. But we get conflicting messages from the corporate media about the Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory 
and their view on the VAC. So I understand that you just said that you've been out there visiting these communities, a lot of them. Is there a consensus there about what their view is on the, on getting the third vaccine? Yeah, look, a lot of them, um, there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy in the communities. A lot of it was on religious grounds um, or just, just fear. Um, so, you know, it, the vac vaccination rates are still very low in communities. Um, and now, that was before we had COVID in the NT. Since we've had COVID, the vaccine rates did jump up a little bit because people did see their, their friends and relatives getting sick. Fortunately, we've had very little serious illness and very few deaths. Um, so, you know, whilst there was a big scare campaign um, out in the communities when COVID did hit the NT, you know, people were going around telling them that they were all going to die. Um, now, seeing as, as I said, fortunately, you know, it wasn't it wasn't that bad at all. Um, very low hospitalisation, very low death rates. Um, so that that hesitancy has returned, and um, yep, yeah, a, a lot of people are saying no, we, we don't we don't see the need to get any more vaccinations. We we don't have the desire to get any more vaccinations. Um, you know, a lot of them are saying we we were lied to. You know, go away, take it away. We don't want it. Mm. Yeah, the exaggeration of the fear campaign is is one hundred and one for the the playbook on on how this played out. Uh, I mean, it's how this played out, but it's also how many other issues have have played out to give more money and power to government, as I think we've all discussed before. Got to say, with the running around telling everyone they're going to die, uh, I, I saw a quip made online somewhere saying, if uh, in the future our grandkids come to us and ask us, you know, how did you survive COVID? The answer will have to be, you know, look, I was just one of the lucky 99.8%. Uh, I was a close one. It's, um, but to, to lighten things up a little, I saw some comments coming in from Rob McCarthy pointing out, uh, Sam, as you were saying, a full ticket, uh, pointing out that Topher was doing a big song and dance last week about being the, um, the first lead Senate candidate of a state uh, for, wow. for the Lib Dem to, to run a full Hang ticket. Um, yes, I'm sorry, JR, there's not a full ticket in New well, South Wales. New South Wales football. obviously wins the gold medal. New South Wales has fielded more candidates than any other state division in the history of the party. So this is sort yeah, of like you know, it's like Fiji winning a couple of silver medals at the goal at the Olympic Games. Well, We're like the United capita, States here in New South Wales. Per capita, if Fiji wins two silver medals, it's a pretty good outcome. I got to say though, Tofa, technically speaking, you could have run six Senate candidates, whereas Sam, I believe, technically speaking, you're only allowed to run two. So if we're Guys, Sam has guys I've, I've held my tongue for long enough. Come on, guys. John, John, yeah, it's not yeah, about yeah. quantity. It's about quality. And well, on that dude. basis alone, Tasmania <laughs> has you absolutely beat, although I will concede that Victoria and the Northern Territory are close behind. Now, Sam, I would love to give you a hard time and put you in your place, but I have a bit of a confession to make. Uh, and that is that we actually had to scramble to get our book filled. And if it weren't for the team, it wasn't actually me that got it filled. If it weren't for the team... Uh, I wouldn't be sitting here basking in the glory of having a full ticket. So you know what? I'm going to, for the first time in my life and probably last, mark it in your diaries, I'm going to swallow a humble pill here and say, well done, Sam, uh, on having a full ticket. You win. <laughs> Thank you. 100%. 100%. 100%. Just remember that, uh, JR, we've got 100%. Yeah. Uh, so, well, Sam, did you impressed. say you did a... Uh, a short little road trip around 3,500 kilometres, just a, a quick duck around on the weekend, was it? I wonder, yeah, yeah, correct. That was that was um, uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday of Easter. Mm. That's just a short little road trip. Tofa, you're going on a road trip. I don't know if this oh, look, is a nice segue look, for what your plans are, but uh, what's in your week? And do you Everyone knows in Tasmania. Everyone knows in Tasmania, we do 3,500 cases just going to the shops. So... <laughs> You know, I think you're making a really big deal over nothing. Uh, actually, that would be around about three and a half laps of Tasmania, depending on exactly which route you you decide to take. Um, look, I, I am heading uh, out on the road f starting on the 2nd of May. I'll be at a uh, Australian Christian Lobby event in Hobart. Uh, and then we are spending three weeks on the road. I've got a bus. They're getting We're getting sign work done on the bus right now. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of an entourage. There's about 10 volunteers that have actually agreed to hit the road with me for three weeks. Uh, we're going to have a heap of fun. We've got some wonderful little flies. Well, I think they're wonderful because I wrote them um, that I've got all over my Facebook page and my Instagram. So if you haven't seen those, have a look, have a chuckle. I will credit John with with um, prompting one of them. There's one that has a PJ O'Rourke quote on the front. 
that giving money and power to politicians is like giving booze and car keys to teenage boys. Uh, that was inspired by John, uh, but I will take credit for for all of the rest. So there's four there. Uh, have a look on my my Facebook or Instagram and, and have a chuckle. And we're, we're obviously, we're trying to raise money because we need to be able to print out DL flyers. So that's that sort of long, tall flyer. Uh, lots and lots of flyers of those little um that artwork there which is very eye-catching they're all intended to be at least somewhat funny and uh intended to not instantly look like political advertising obviously they are they've got the authorizations and the logos it's all above board but when people see the front of it uh they're going to be going oh what's this rather than oh it's another political thing so they've been designed very specifically that way we need the the budget to be able to um to be able to print out a lot of those so if that's something you'd like to help with send a message to to the tofa page or to the ldp and uh, and let the ldp know that you'd like to do that but um the the road trip itself is going to be a lot of fun but there's actually something slightly more urgent uh and that is uh i've been i've been having dances with um dances with the australian electoral commission over the last two weeks, uh, we've been we've been enjoying a part de deux and uh, all about the authorizations. So we've all seen those horrible authorizations at the end of, of every political ad, etc. Authorized by this person, blah 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 blah. So I put up a couple of videos before I had even decided, before I'd even agreed to run for politics. Uh, which I mean, John, I knocked you back how many times this year? I think twice this year before I finally said yes, and I've knocked you back every other election for the last who knows how long. Never. I've never asked you before. I don't know what you're talking about. This is a uh-huh. scandal. Yeah. Right um, so running for politics was not high on my list of things to do. And it was <laughs> the third time that John uh, came and, and and I said, are you sure um, that I finally said yes? And that was literally only about a week before we actually announced. So these videos had been recorded and I was making them and I put them online before I announced and didn't even think that it might need an authorization statement. Well, apparently it does because uh, you can't be trusted, dear Australian voters, to look at my face and hear my voice and look at my name on the TV that was behind me in those videos and know that it was me, right? You need the authorization statement to tell you who's behind that video. You can't be trusted to figure that out for yourself. Um, so I had to take those videos down, which of course me, I did a couple, about a half a million views across all the different platforms, uh, tens of thousands of shares. So there's all these links that go to those videos, people sharing it, getting other people to watch it. I'll never recover those links. They're, they're broken forever. Um, and I just thought, you know what? I'm not just going to put a little authorization statement on the end of the same videos and re-upload them. I'm going to re-record uh, and I'm going to take the piss a little bit and uh, and have a bit of fun because uh, they, they kind of annoyed me. They kind of, I, I don't know. You may not know this about me, but I get annoyed by bureaucracy. I, I know that's a bombshell, right? I, I get annoyed by petty people with petty little empires messing with my life in ways that are completely counterproductive and, and unnecessary. And I know that surprises you. I'm such an even-handed, level-headed person that never gets upset by petty bureaucrats. I know that that's how you think of me, but I've got to admit, every now and again, they get under my skin. So I had a bit of fun with that. So uh, check out the uh, the new Marbles, how, how Preferential Voting Works video. It's on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. It went up only about an hour ago. Uh, so have a look at that. Have a bit of a giggle. And make sure you share that because... There's this thing called the Streisand effect. And I'll finish on this and I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking, John. There's this thing called the Streisand effect. Barbara Streisand, famous American singer or Jewish American singer, um, there were photos of her on the internet and she wanted them removed. And so she went to court and said, these photos need to be removed from the internet. Not really understanding how the internet works. And so what happens? Well, of course, as soon as the he, she gets a court order saying, yes, we need to remove these from the internet. Uh, can we call the internet? Who do we call? Who's the, who, who owns the internet? We just got to call the internet and tell them to take them down. <laughs> And of course, everyone on the internet just starts sharing the crap out of these photos to make sure that everyone's seen them. So let's do a little bit of a Streisand effect on this video. Can we do that? Can you help me to make sure that as many people as possible, way more than would ever have seen the originals, thanks to uh, the petty bureaucrats giving me a hard time. Can we Streisand effect this? Make sure it gets into the hands of every Australian. So some of the... uh, some of the most common comments coming in when we first started this uh, live stream were people saying, great Marbles video, uh, loved your new Marbles video. So uh, it's good that it's come up now. We will, uh, sorry, Rob McCarthy, if you're listening to me, uh, we, we will embed the, a link to that video in the write-up to this uh, to this video on YouTube. We'll put it in as a comment on, on Facebook somewhere so you will be able to find it. If it's not there now, it will be soon. Uh, but yes, great videos. Sofa, love your work. And uh, I am surprised to hear that you find bureaucracy uh, frustrating. The rest of us find it so enjoyable. So um, I know, shocking, right? Uh, <clears throat> indeed. 
um, we've got the a lot of love coming in here. Tofi, you're sharing all the uh, the comments, questions. If there are questions coming in, uh, feel free to to chuck them up there, especially if they're difficult ones, especially if they uh, are tricky for Jr. or or anyone else who's been cheeky today. Um, definitely. Sorry, I wanted to circle back. This isn't to. I wanted to do this slowly, so it didn't seem like I was just segueing straight away from Tofa. Love your work, Tofa. But I did want to come back as to something that we we didn't uh, unpack as much as we could. Uh, Sam Sam McMahon in the Northern Territory. I, I am not an expert in Northern Territory politics, but as you would know, I took a bit of a crash course over the last couple of months. Uh, I was taking a bit of an interest. And a consistent theme I heard from everybody a, a, across basically the Territory, from people who weren't coordinating, they weren't getting together and telling each other to tell me this. These were quite separate, different people, some of whom don't like each other. And everyone told me that the country Liberal Party is falling apart. The, the CLP, you mentioned the CLP, the acronym for people outside the Northern Territory. That's the Country Liberal Party, which is basically just what the, the Liberals or the Nationals call themselves in the NT. They don't have a Liberal Party or a National Party. The coalition is the Country Liberal Party in the NT. Uh, and the the drumbeat of criticisms uh, and comments about not just the, the CLP isn't doing a good job, but everyone's leaving. Uh, and the, the party has a serious threat of actually not being there in the near future if they keep up this trajectory. Now, uh, am I just hearing what I want to hear? Uh, but Or, or is, is there something going on in the Northern Territory about a shift in the non-Labor side of politics? Yeah, John, I mean, that's 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 absolutely true. I mean, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to bag out the CLP, but, you know, part of the reason that I'm here is because of the dysfunctionality and the decline and decay of the CLP. Um, you know, they've got some fine MLAs in the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly, but uh, the party itself and the management of the party, <clears throat> I mean, you've had so many resignations in the last six months, um, people that I know, and I, I, won't name, I won't name them unless they've gone public themselves, but, you know, that's accelerated um, certainly in, in the last couple of months. Uh, you've had the president um, quit. I don't think he's quit the party entirely, but he quit as the president of the party. Uh, you've had the senior vice president quit the party. Uh, you've had a couple of uh, long-time um, party members, including branch chairs and former MLAs, um, quit the party. And a whole pile of young people disturbingly um, for, for a party. I mean, it's young people are its lifeblood. A whole pile of young people um, have resigned and there's a heap more that haven't actively resigned but have said, well, I'm just gonna let my membership run out and when that runs out, I'm done. Uh, so, so yes, they've, you know, I heard a figure, they've always had around 500 members. It's, it's waxed and waned over the years. And I heard a figure quoted to me by someone who is still in the uh, the party that they've currently got about um, 280, but I do know that that membership includes includes myself because I still get sent correspondence, despite the fact that I resigned quite some time ago and they accepted my resignation at a central council, but I'm still on their list. Uh, as are quite a lot of dead people. Um, so, you know, it, for, for whatever reason, and, you know, various people have submitted very long explanations with their resignations as to, to the reasons of the decline of the party. But um, for whatever reason, yes, um, the party structure, the party management is, is crumbling and, um, you know, it's kind of at the moment, it's a little bit of the case of, you know, we're the last one, last one out the door, turn the light off. Mm. Sam, That's a, Sam, one just, just, thing to note just, there is that you said uh, from 500 down to under 300. Of course, under the new rules set by the, the coalition government, uh, without a sitting uh, MP or senator, which they don't have at the moment, you're supposed to have 1,500 members to be a, a political party. Now, we've got 15,000 in the Lib Dems, so we're fine. Uh, but it doesn't seem like the CLP would pass that test, which is uh, an interesting thing to note, given the, the, the history of the, the coalition on this issue. Yeah, no, they, they wouldn't pass that test. And... Um, you know, they, there was a bit of concern when I resigned. A lot of people within the party were like, oh, well, you know, where does this leave us now because we don't have a, a sitting member or senator? And I'm like, well, it doesn't actually change anything because, you know, you guys, and, and they're upset about the change, which increased 
the membership requirements from 500 up to 1500 so it was previously 500 and they're upset about that and i said well it doesn't you know it's not going to change anything because you know you you never would have had 1500 um you, you historically you're battling to make 500 um so you know you're not you're not a, a federal party but of course you know that has been investigated by the adc but the um you know the, the issuing of the writs stopped the aec investigation so you know they they are you know for all purposes still considered a federal party for this election um but obviously if they don't get a uh, a member or senator up at this election then yes they will cease to be a federal party and they'll probably even struggle to be a territory party i think you need 200 members for for territory and they probably would start to struggle for that so, Sam, are, these, are these resignations because of i know everyone's got their own story but is it largely because of policy differences or personality clashes um, look, it can be a little of both, but, <clears throat> you know, there's been personality clashes in the party for forever, um, but we haven't seen the resignations that we're seeing now. Um, it doesn't seem to be so much policy because there is no policy coming out of the party. Um, the only policy they, that comes what out of the party... What do they say about the all the vaccine craziness? Uh, well, that, that's caused a lot of people to resign. That has been one thing that has caused a lot of resignations because um, the party, as in the party political wing, um, so the leader of the opposition, came out very strongly and backed um, <clears throat> the Cho and the Labor Party on the vaccine mandates. Um, now, that sent a lot of members... Um, you know, they, they, they went berserk on it um, and a lot of members were extremely angry that this had been decided as a position of the party just on the spot by the political wing with no consideration given to, um, you know, the, the, the policy committee or the central council or any of the people that generally would decide party policy. So there are a lot of people extremely angry over that. And the fact that they stuck to their guns, they stuck to the we support mandates. And, um, you know, the, the membership of the party was was just incredulous um, about that. And, and that has certainly sparked a lot of the resignations and the fact that the uh, management committee of the party was seemingly unable to to step up and um, and do anything about it. Yep. Sounds like um, there's a lot of votes to be got there, Sam. I mean, yep, there like certainly is. It also sounds, sounds like, like uh, the, the in Victoria, of course, where the Liberals went weak, the uh, the drumbeat became that uh, David Limbrick, our man on the spot, became effectively the real leader of the opposition because he was the only one actually doing any real opposing. Uh, Sam, it sounds like you're uh, playing the same role in the Northern Territory. The, uh, the country Liberal Party has gone MIA uh, and you're leading the real opposition to the mess of the Gunner government. Uh, up there. Um, I, I would note, in terms of the people splitting away from the CLP and coming to us, uh, the former vice president of the CLP uh, now is uh, Sam's running mate on the, the Senate ticket, Jed Hansen. Uh, th this, they, they didn't come as a package deal. This was, uh, you know, set different people spinning off the CLP for different reasons uh, and coming to us through different channels. Uh, and just having a similar story of the CLP is, um, is on its way out. There needs to be a better option. Uh, so it's, it's great to be able to bring together some of the best people from the, the former CLP uh, in the Northern Territory. So love your work, Sam. I did. Uh, I do remember you said you had an appointment. You might not be able to stick around. If you are try, staying out of politeness, you, you are off the hook. You don't have to be polite to us. <laughs> um, if you have time, feel free to stick around. But I'll, uh, I was just giving you an easy way to, to segue out if you wanted it. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you, everyone. I, I am I am going to have to go because I, I did have this other uh, meeting to go to that I need to turn up. Um, so I'm, I'm very sorry to leave you a little bit sooner. Um, but thank you very much. It's been a blast. Thanks for chatting, thank Sam. Thank you. And Good luck. to having you back uh, again in a future week. Yep. Uh,
another topic that came up earlier that uh, I think might be worthwhile segueing back onto is the debate from last night. Now, there's a apparently there's a little debate going on now that no one's watching. A few people I saw commenting saying that they switched over from Sky to us because we're much more fun. I appreciate it. Um, saying you're more fun than Morrison and Albanese. We're setting the bar low, but I'll take it. You know, that's that's compliments, compliment. But of course, the real debate, the real debate that mattered was the one last night. Uh, between some of the the minor parties that are capturing people's imagination, capturing people's attention, they had uh, was it Bob Catter, Pauline Hanson, uh, Clive Palmer, and of course our lead Senate candidate for Queensland, Campbell Newman, uh, up on a stage at the Gold Coast having a bit of a discussion. I don't know how much of a debate it was. They agreed on half the issues, but there was some debate in there. Um, fellas, did you get a chance to watch Jr? I know you're a uh, well, I guess we all are a political tragic, but you're a political tragic par excellence. Did you? Uh, have any hot takes from that the real debate from last night uh, look, look look we like these other parties we like the uap we like pauline we like bob catter okay but there are stark differences and mm. i think a lot of people are thinking look, i think it was topher that sort of coined the term the freedom friendly parties which has really caught on and i think that's a terrific description okay but i think you know i think it's important that the viewers of this show see understand what the difference is between the liberal democrats and the two other major freedom friendly parties, which is the UAP and Font. Now, the people last night were asked, uh, what do you think about, it hasn't privatization been a bad thing? All those assets we sold off in the 1980s. There, there was a comment on that a moment ago that I, I thought would be worth actually talking about. He was Lizzie making a comment. So I'm glad you've gone straight into that, John. I just wanted to bring the comment back up. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, okay, well, Lizzie, I'm sorry, but I am going to disagree with you. I am going to disagree with you on this. Okay, so with the example of the Commonwealth Bank was was made. Okay, and Paul and Hanson said, "Look at all the profits it makes today. You know that could have been owned by the share. That could have been owned by the taxpayers." I said, "Okay, the Commonwealth the Commonwealth Bank was a crappy little government department that also happened to be a bank. Okay, and then it was privatised by the Labor government, supported by the Liberal government." But in the 80s and the 90s, because of Thatcher and Reagan, all around the world, things were being privatised. And in pretty much every single example, a thing that used to be a government-owned department, like the Commonwealth Bank, and then it got owned by the private sector, had a hell of a lot more uh, uh, dynamism about it and ingenuity about it. And people, executives work harder because they know if they work hard, they get more money. Okay, And so what we have today with that little crappy little government department called the Commonwealth Bank is now worth it close to 200 billion dollars it's australia's most valuable company it's worth four times what elon musk has uh offered to buy twitter for okay mm. now now on top now what and what it makes 10 billion dollars a year in profit well that's because it's had private sector management pauline i'm sorry and and, and what happens with that profit well 30 percent of it gets given straight back to the taxpayers that's pretty good pauline isn't it three billion a year for nothing for nothing Oh, but then we have, then what happens to the other 70%? Well, a little bit of it's reinvested in the business, but not much. Return to shareholders. And what are those shareholders? Those shareholders pay tax on it too. Okay, at, so at, at the risk of rabbit holing a little bit here, I, I do want to make one point um, that the banking sector and the Commonwealth Bank was privatized, but it remains a highly regulated, and when I use the word regulated, think protected industry. They enjoy a tremendous amount of government protection. It's actually, it's interesting to note, now my numbers are a little bit out of date, so forgive me if something's changed a little bit, but as of about five years ago, the four major Australian banks were all in the top 10 most profitable banks in the world, yep. but they were not in the top 100 for the amount of money they had under management or loaned out. So there is something about the Australian banking sector that allows them to make uh, disproportionate profits compared to the rest. Now, this isn't a sign that the government should privatise them. It's a sign that the government actually is manipulating the market. If they're making such disproportionate profits that are not market sustainable anywhere else in the world, then I would suggest the problem isn't that the government needs to take ownership of it. It's probably that the government needs to stop manipulating that market sector and allow more competition so that their massive profits would probably actually drop at that point simply through the natural function of the market. That is certainly true. It's one of the most overregulated uh, industries in the country. But mm. I've got to say the two things that jumped out to me, JR, in what you said, and I've got to admit I haven't seen the, the debate yet, but if what you're saying is uh, an accurate reflection of what Pauline said, uh, the idea that if something is profitable, it should be owned by the government, that, that concept generalized that. 
Like take that concept and generalize it. And it is literally socialism. I mean, that is the concept that you can only have a private business if it's not profitable. Mm -hmm. That's incoherent. I mean, profit mm -hmm. is, a, is a good thing. Firstly, the people making the profit, they're Australians. And it's good that Australians make profit. It's people who have super accounts, people who have, uh, you know, bank accounts. Uh, but that, that is a, a scary attitude. And I've got to say, the other thing that jumps immediately to mind, and I think DL might like to, sorry, David Limbrick might like to jump in on, on this comment about some of the other freedom-friendly minor parties. There's a couple of issues where they believe in freedom. Uh, but if your go-to instinct is there's something about some industry I don't like, so I'm going to trust politicians and bureaucrats to run it for me, <laughs> you just say that aloud. I mean, I don't like this industry, so I want to trust Scott Morrison, Anthony Albanese, and a pack of bureaucrats who don't even like us. I want to trust them to have complete control without competition and oversight by themselves. Mm. That is a remarkable distrust of the common person and a remarkable amount of faith in politicians and bureaucrats. And I don't share that faith. I mean, the defining mm. feature of this party is we lack faith in politicians and bureaucrats, and we have faith <laughs> in ordinary Australians to make their own decisions. Yeah. Or more to the point, we don't, you know, pe people say, oh, I don't trust people. Well, therefore, you shouldn't trust politicians. Oh, but, you know, we can trust people. Okay, then you don't need politicians. It doesn't matter whether you trust people or not. Either way, the argument doesn't work. The government is not the right the right mechanism. I want to respond to Don here. Uh, Pauline's point was that government utilities and corporations should be run at cost, not for profit. This is something that on the surface looks very attractive. And I was already sus suspicious of this idea. But then when I went to Venezuela in 2014, uh, this idea was proven to be just completely incorrect. What gets missed in this argument is the efficiency with which it's run. See, the, the Venezuelan government nationalized the oil industry. They have the largest proven heavy oil reserves in the world, more than Iran, more than Saudi Arabia, more than Russia, more than anybody else. They should be absolutely rolling in money, and they were back when that oil was being privately <clears throat> um, mined and, and distributed and sold around the world. Massive profits that then paid taxes and employed people and everything else. Uh, they, When the social, socialists took power, they nationalized the, the fuel, the entire industry. And very quickly, productivity began to drop. Efficiency began to drop. It very quickly got to the point where they couldn't sell the oil on the global market because they'd be losing money on every single barrel that they sold. They ended up not refining any of their own petrol, and now the entire industry has collapsed. The people get all of the profits. The problem is there aren't any. The difference between private and government is the incentive for, for efficiency. And that's why government ownership so often fails and why when it gets privatized, you end up with these big profits. But just because you can, you know, just because there's profits there doesn't mean those profits will continue if it's back in government hands. Look, yeah, I, and I know the, I, sorry, David. I think we've allowed um, the socialists to take control of language and poison words. And one of those words that's been poisoned is privatization. Even the the blue socialists in the Liberal Party are too scared to talk about this word. But it's literally the opposite of socialism, right? Um, you know, government means of the own, ownership of production is socialism. Private means of of the of the means of production is capitalism, right? And this is what we're talking about. We've allowed this to be poisoned to the point where if we talk about taking something out of government hands, putting it into a competitive market, um, then uh, that's deemed to be naturally bad and people instinctively think it's bad. But um, that's not the case at all. Now, I accept that, um, you know, with banks in particular, that's an interesting case because it is a very, very highly protected market. So we, we don't have a government monopoly, but we do have a very highly protected market. But I mean, that's a case for dere further deregulation. That's not a case for nationalisation. And it's the same with utilities and other things. So, I mean, you know, this idea that the government can run things as a national monopoly, well, you know, that's that's socialism that you're arguing for. Yeah, look, I think uh, scratching the surface on this, perhaps it is, and I don't mean to throw them under the bus, it might have made sense at the time, but um, John Howard and before him, the Hawke-Keating governments, uh, they, they achieved some privatization, but note the language they used. And I think that language sticks with us today. Most people think the purpose of privatization is so that the government has money. Uh, you know, Howard and Costello argued, you've got to privatize Telstra to pay down the debt. Uh, other people say, you know, privatize uh, something and, and use some of that money. I think there was a rural dividend to go and spend a bunch of money in, in rural seats to help the National Party. Uh, whatever it is that the language used to justify privatization was often so that they could use that money that they get from selling a product. The purpose of privatization is nothing to do with that, according to, to economists that, that want to help the economy prosper. It's exactly as, as Topher said, and as David uh, referred to there, it's because the private competitive private sector 
runs things better, right? Not just for itself. Yes, they make profit, but look at actually the quality of the product for the consumer. Look at the quality of the, the wages for the worker in those companies. The wages go up, the products get better, and the products get cheaper over time. And that's, what's, what, that's what productivity is. That's what efficiency is. And that's the reason we prefer capitalism to socialism. And that's the reason we tend to prefer you know, private ownership. That's privatization gets you private ownership. Uh, that's the real reason, but that's not really what Costello said when he was prosecuting the argument. He didn't say privatize Telstra to make it more efficient. He said, give me the money so I can pay down the debt. And I think it might have made sense at the time, but we're kind of paying for it now because people have in their minds the wrong reason for privatization. Now, I have a little suggestion on that. Uh, to help knock people out of that belief set, one way to achieve privatization without getting people distracted on what you can do with the money is you, you could sell government utilities. You could have sold Telstra, and they did. One option is they could have given it away to every Australian citizen or every Australian voter. Now, that would have made the money government zero money, but that's not the point. It would have put it into private hands. Look, this is what I think we should do with ABC. They call it your ABC. I tell you what, if it's really our ABC, give us all a share, right? And we can decide whether we want to keep our share or sell our share, and the shares will be uh, traded on the stock market, and it'll be a privatized ABC. If it's our ABC, give it to us. We don't need to sell it. Give it to us. So um, that's my pitch well, on privatization. I love that idea. Yeah, it's not my AB it's not your ABC unless you can sell it, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, so this this segued off a little bit from the debate last night. Any other hot comments from the the debate uh, from last night, the the Mavericks debate? Uh, so far, David, did you um, see anything worth commenting on? Or I, I'll admit I didn't tune in because I was at Paul yeah. Barker's. Let that go through to the keeper. Um. I think it would have been, uh, perhaps we can come back to this next week when we have Campbell in the room and he can uh, tell us what it was like to be in the hot seats for those uh, those other three. Uh, JR, you were going to say? I thought Topher was talking, but it was on mute. Okay, uh, you are just telling him that. I was trying to. Yes, no, we, we can uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm the one in charge of the buttons, so that's entirely my fault. Um, no, I was, I was just going to say, the point that was made earlier that yes, there's a lot of similarities between these, what I've dubbed the freedom friendly minor parties. There are some, some, some substantial differences and without animosity, I think it's important to discuss that because some people, I, I guess, aren't seeing the differences. And, and what I would say about the liberal Democrats and the reason why I've chosen to join the liberal Democrats as opposed to anybody else uh, is because without wanting to put it too bluntly, the liberal Democrats understand economics. Um, and unfortunately, a number of these other parties uh, are a bit lacking in that department. And given that money and economics and the economy is such a foundational part of our lives, you cannot pr uh, improve freedom without improving freedom in economics. And so an understanding of economics is, is just so important. So I, I would say that's probably one of the big, big areas. And I'll, I'll illustrate that point through a conversation that I've had with a, a currently serving uh, member of the, the Australian uh, Federal Parliament. Uh, where we were discussing some of the, the the need to bring back more Australian manufacturing, an objective that I agree with. Uh, and this individual was advocating for the need for government assistance programs, subsidies to help them cover the cost of energy. If they were a heavy manufacturing industry and they needed lots of energy, then the government could subsidise that. Uh, perhaps some special treatment in certain visa types that might get certain types of people coming from overseas to work in their industries. Various kind of government programs and carve-outs. And that's unfortunately a mentality that's very common in the major parties, Liberal, Labor, Nationals, Greens. They love their carve-outs. They love their programs. But it's also quite pernicious and quite common among a lot of the smaller parties. Whereas for a Liberal Democrat, and, and these fine gentlemen can correct me if I, if I uh, misstate this, but we would love to see manufacturing in Australia. But we would love to see it return to Australia because it makes economic sense for people to set up manufacturing here because they're competitive on a global stage, because electricity is not so expensive. Labor laws and, and industrial relations have been improved so that there's more flexibility and people can actually make better working arrangements that maybe cost employers less, but, but satisfy employees more. There's a lot of things that we can do to actually reduce the cost of manufacturing to bring manufacturing back. And that's based on an understanding of economics. So we have the same objective. I'd love to see a robust manufacturing sector in Australia. In fact, I think it's a national security risk that we don't have one. But I'm not going to pursue that with the, by, by the use of spending taxpayers' money on special carve-outs. So that's one illustration of the kinds of differences you'll find between the Liberal Democrats uh, and some of these other parties. If you, if you slash taxes, make uh, energy cheap and abundant, 
uh, manufacturing will come back. In fact, mm. you know, we, we saw, I think it was in um, Ireland when they slashed their corporate tax rate. All of a sudden they became uh, corporate headquarters of the world, right? I would love mm -hmm. Australia to become the corporate headquarters of the world. They keep talking about these multinational corporations, uh, you know, sending their profits offshore to lower mm -hmm. tax environments. Why not send them offshore from other countries to Australia if we're a low tax environment? I would love us mm -hmm. to be... Uh, the corporate headquarters of the world. I would love companies to come here for our cheap energy and cheap taxes. It would be wonderful. Way ahead of you, Tasmania is going to be the next Singapore. Okay, we're well, carving out a special that, economic that zone. Wonderful to me, <laughs> Tasmania. Uh, we are going to have a ship's registry. We're going to be a tax haven. We're going to we're going to we're going to rock it. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Sounds to me like you're about to start the uh, Tasmania independence movement. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> office. Shut down the federation. All right, I, I won't say a thing. I like I, it will make the AFL yeah. an international sport. So, um, if you break up the federation, so there's, there's upsides. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. enough of that. Now we've hit the hour mark. We do try to keep it to an hour here on this show, so uh, we won't have time to do the final wrap ups from everyone. The final wrap ups will just be everyone saying goodbye. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, do come back every Wednesday, seven thirty. Similar faces. We rotate the guests a little bit, but you'll get used to the regular people that are always back here. And I think uh, we've already got a theme for next week. Let's do a bit of a deep dive into some of the economic debates happening between the minor parties. That'll be fun. So come back for that Wednesday, 7.30. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. And Tofa, uh, thank you. Uh, this is authorized by John Humphreys for the Liberal Democratic Party, Mount Waverley, Victoria. <laughs>